Can we, can we begin, Prabhu? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Jadandotrana. Hare Krishna, my obeisances, all glories to Prabhupada. Maharaj, you can start, Maharaj. Okay. You voted that fine again, but we can Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschacya Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so we welcome everyone to our ongoing study of Srimad Bhagavatam at the level of Bhakti Vaibhav and we are studying Canto number 6 and we are on the last chapter, chapter number 19. Chapter 19, Performing the Pumsavana Ritualistic Ceremony. So, uh, we heard in Chapter 18, we heard about the situation, the, the desire of Mother DT, how she wanted to have a son who would kill Indra. But by the intelligence of her good husband, Kashyap, he engaged her in the process of devotional service. And the result was that she didn't just have one son, but she had she had she had forty nine sons. And they were not demons who were going to kill Indra, but they were brothers of Indra. They were the Maruts. And they ended up going to the heavenly planets along with King Indra. So this pastime pointed out the, the power of bhakti, that by engaging someone in devotional service, even though they have material desires, they can be purified. They can be greatly benefited. And we saw that both Indra and Diti benefited by engaging in devotional service. Of course, Indra, he was serving Mother Diti. And Mother Diti, she was engaged in the actual devotional service. But because Indra was serving Diti, who was engaging in devotional service, he also got, the, got purification. So at the end of the chapter, the last chapter, chapter 18, we have from Maharaj Pariksit, or, or rather Sukadeva Goswami was describing the particular benefits which uh, one gets by performing that vrat. And he describes how Mother Diti was satisfied, although 
she, in the beginning she wanted a, a son who was going to kill Indra, but after she performed the Vrat for one year, for ne almost one year, she, she became actually satisfied just by doing devotional service. Her mind became peaceful and she wasn't feeling so much bitterness towards Indra anymore. And she was actually satisfied by Indra's good behavior. So although you were criticizing a little bit, we heard some criticism of Indra last week that you thought, what kind of person is this Indra that he wanted to kill the child in her womb? But Indra showed also good behavior because he served Mother Diti for nearly one year. He'd done a lot of personal service for her, bringing her fruits and flowers and roots and wood for cooking on, for performing yagya. He did a lot of service. So she became, her opinion about Indra changed. And Indra also, he didn't have any bitterness towards Diti, that he was also respectful towards Mother Diti. And at the end of the chapter, Sukadeva Goswami then says to Maharaj Parikshit, so you can inquire more and I will, ex I will try to explain more to you. You want to know some more about what happened? You have any questions? Then tell me and I'll explain it to you. Because he, ha he hadn't really explained how to perform the actual ceremony, what you have to do, what's required. So that's going to be explained now in this 19th chapter. And that, that's the connection between 18 and 19. So chapter begins with Maharaj Parikshit <clears throat> putting a question that text text number one oh I'll share the screen with you uh, Okay, so text number one. My dear Lord, you have already spoken about the Pumsavana vow. Now I want to hear about it in detail, for I understand that by observing this vow, one can please the Supreme Lord Vishnu. So Sukadeva Goswami immediately begins, without hesitation. He's ready to explain what you have to do. Someone wants to have a son. You want to do. You want to do it this way. It takes one year. You get a very, very good son. So the first day on the bright fortnight of the month of Agrahayana, November December, following the instructions of her husband, a woman should begin this regulative devotional service. So this is Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. Right? And, and it's, you make a vow. Of course, it's only going to be for one year, not forever. When we take up Krishna consciousness, we make a vow to chant Hare Krishna and follow regular principles for life, not just for one year. But this is a particular vow, particular vat for a particular purpose in mind. And so, it's mentioned by Sukadeva Goswami, before beginning the worship of Lord Vishnu, the woman should hear the story of how the Maruts were born. Under the instruction of qualified Brahmanas in the morning, she should wash her teeth, bathe, dress herself with white cloth and ornaments. And before taking breakfast, she should worship Lord Vishnu and Lakshmi. And then, we're told how to pray. We're given the prayers. Text number four continues. My dear Lord, you are full of in all opulences, but I do not beg you for opulence 
I simply offer my respectful obeisances unto you. You are the husband and master of Lakshmi Devi, the goddess of fortune, who has all opulences. Therefore, you are the master of all mystic yoga. I simply offer my obeisances unto you. So this is very nice prayer, devotees. We, we should note how the prayer said, I have nothing to beg. I do not beg you for opulence. This, is, this should be the mood of devotee. We don't want to go begging to the Lord to ask him for opulence. If we need it, he will give it. Of course, the Lord Vishnu himself, he has all opulence. He's a husband of the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi. So they have all opulence. It's all in their control. And if he wants, he can give. But why should we want to ask? We, a devotee doesn't want to take from the Lord, but rather the desire of the devotee is to give. A devotee who is in pure consciousness is happy to want to just serve the Lord. He doesn't want to take benedictions from the Lord. But at the same time, if a devotee needs, Prabhupada says here, whatever a devotee needs will be supplied by the complete Supreme Personality of Godhead. And this is a verse from Bhagavad Gita, Yoga Shema Vaham Yaham. So the pure devotee will not ask anything from the Lord. He simply offers the Lord his obeisances and the Lord is prepared to accept whatever the devotee can secure to worship him. So then Prabhupada quotes a leaf, a flower, a fruit, water, and Prabhupada said, there's no need to artificially exert oneself, right? There's no need to exert oneself. It is better to be plain and simple and with respectful obeisances offered to the Lord whatever one can secure. The Lord is completely able to bless the devotee with all opulences. Of course, at the same time, if we have the ability to offer more to the Lord, we can offer it. But Prabhupada is stating here, better to be plain and simple and with respectful obeisances offer to the Lord whatever one can secure. So if one is able to secure more, then it's certainly very nice to offer more to the Lord. We don't want to just minimize everything and think, well, why should I give more? And so he doesn't want money. He has everything. But according to our ability, whatever is practical. But Prabhupada saying, plain and simple. But when it comes to temples, in our temples, Prabhupada like to see the offerings done nicely. He like he would he, when Prabhupada would visit the temple, he would always say, "Bring me the maha. Let me see what's off being offered to the deities." And then he would taste it, and then he would comment, and sometimes he would praise it, and sometimes he would condemn. He would say, "Very poor. What's going?" He said, "Don't you know how to cook?" And Prabhupada would chastise the devotees, tell, and he would often go in the kitchen himself and show the devotees how to cook and how to prepare proper offerings for the deities. So Prabhupada was very concerned. I remember also in the UK, in London, when we would arrange a program. This was way back, the beginning of our movement, 1971. Prabhupada came to London and we had programs in civic halls. There was one uh, suburb of London. It's a town hall, quite a big place. And we rented it, had a program. Prabhupada came, gave a lecture. 
some people came, you know, mixed crowd, not a lot of people. But we distributed prasadam and Prabhupada said, let me see what prasadam you are giving. And Prabhupada would taste it, see, oh, very good, yes, very nice. Prabhupada was very concerned like that. What prasadam is being distributed? It should be nicely prepared, it should be proper. So while he says, keep it plain and simple, at the same time, Prabhupada didn't mind if you did more, if you were able to do more. But it should be something which is regular, which you can maintain. Okay, uh, going ahead, more, more prayers, how the devotee prays to the Lord, text number five, because you're endowed with causeless mercy, all opulences, all prowess and all glories, strength and transcendental qualities, you are the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Master of everyone. So, of course, this is worship of Lord Vishnu we're hearing about. Lord Vishnu is worshipped with great awe and reverence. The worship of Krishna, Prabhupada told us when we worship Radha and Krishna, we should also worship them in the mood of Lakshmi Narayan. Because the worship of Radha and Krishna is very exalted, very high level. And he said, better that in, you, in the beginning you just worship them in the mood of Lakshmi Narayan. And as you become more advanced, then you may become more to the spontaneous level and you can worship them in the mood of Vrindavan. But again, Prabhupada quotes about Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam, in, in, indicating simple and plain and Prabhupada said Krishna is full in himself he not but he none, nonetheless becomes pleased when the devotee offers him a leaf flower fruit or water so this purport here is very interesting actually Prabhupada is pointing out about this wonderful rasa between the Lord and the devotees, right? He said, he is Krishna or Vishnu, he is extremely kind to his devotee. Although he is full in himself, he nonetheless wants all the living entities to surrender unto him so that they may engage in his service. Thus he becomes satisfied. So certainly that's the business it's a desire of every devotee. We want to satisfy the Supreme Lord. We know that's our success. So then Prabhupada talks about how sometimes the Lord will instruct the devotee. Just like in the purport here, he said, sometimes the Lord, as a child of Mother Yashoda, requests his devotee for some food as if he were very hungry. Why, why would Krishna need food? But as a child he would often tell Mother Yashoda, I'm hungry, I, you feed me. Sometimes he tells his devotee in a dream that his temple and his garden are now very old and that he cannot enjoy them very nicely. So sometimes devotees, some very pure devotees, they would may be given dreams like that. The Lord can come in the dream and give them an instruction that if maybe the devotee has some wealth and he wants that devotee to use his wealth to renovate the temple or maybe he wants the devotee to take care of the garden temple gardens, temple grounds, they should be taken care of. Prabhupada was very concerned about these kind of things. He wanted to see that the temple properties were well maintained. 
and he didn't like to see the devotees chopping and changing all the time. If, if they renovated the temple, he expected them to keep it like that. He didn't expect that two years later they'd renovate the temple again. It happened like that one time in Los Angeles, that uh, they'd renovated the temple, gone to a lot of trouble, spent a lot of money in renovating the temple, and then two years later they wanted to renovate it again. And Prabhupada was really upset. He said, what? You just renovated it two years back. Why do you want to renovate again? And so taking care of the temple was important, but not that you have to take care, renovate the temple every year, but it should be maintained. Everything should be maintained properly. Not that you have to re knock it all down and rebuild it every two years. So gardens also have to be looked after. Prabhupada liked to see the devotees make use of the land to grow flowers, to offer to the deities. And if they have gardens, they must keep it nice. Uh, so sometimes Krishna will instruct the devotees to to repair or to take care of these things. And then Prabhupada gives another example. He says, sometimes he's buried in the earth as if unable to come out. Right? Can you think of an example? The Lord was buried in the earth and unable to come out? Gopalji by Madhvendra Puri. Right, yes. Even Rupa Swami's and it is also Radha Govindavji. Srinathji, yes, was in in the Govardhan hill, and he was he want he appeared in the dream of Madhavendra Puri, so Madhavendra Puri got some devotees to help him, and they excavated him out and established the deity worship, and you gave that the other example. Who did you give, Manaji? Hare Krishna. Maharaj, Yes, what's the story? What's the story about Radha Govinda? Where were they? Uh, he came, actually, he came in the dream that uh, there is one place, there is one cow is milking. Something like that. Not properly remembered. Hmm. Okay, I'm not very clear also. It's not very well documented. But one cow is milking there at one place and uh, uh, he searched and there uh, he got deities, Radha Govindavji. Okay. Only Govindavji, not Radha, only Govindavji. Radha okay. came, uh, uh, their pastime is another. Okay, so anyway, the Lord, the point is, the Lord, although the Lord is complete in Himself and He can do everything, but still He requests His devotees to rescue Him. So the Lord is asking, He's giving the devotee that, that direction that He wants the devotee to do service for Him. Right? Reading from Prabhupada's purport, Sometimes he requests a devotee, his devotee, to preach his glories all over the world, although he alone is quite competent to perform this task. So this is a, a very special uh, purport which Prabhupada is giving and he's revealing some of his own realizations, you know, Krishna personally instructed him in his dream, rather you could say Rupa Goswami personally instructed him to go to the West and to write his books and to preach. You know, he's saying Krishna could have done it himself, but he, he instructs his devotee, he wants his devotee to get the credit. Even though the Supreme Personality of Godhead is endowed with all possessions and is self-sufficient, 
He depends on his devotees. Oh, so this is the, the special mercy of Lord Krishna, that he depends on the mercy of his devotees. He doesn't need to do, he, he could do everything himself, but he gives the devotee the chance to do service for him. Therefore, the relationship of the Lord with his devotee is extremely confidential. Only the devotee can perceive how the Lord, although full in himself, depends on his devotee for some particular work. All right. Maybe you can think of some more examples where Krishna instructed, depended on his devotee for some particular work. Well, Prabhupada quotes from Bhagavad Gita here in the purple, from 11th chapter, Nimitta Matra Bhava Savya Sachin. Krishna is telling Arjuna, just be an instrument in my service. Now Krishna could have won the battle himself. Krishna wanted the battle fought, but Krishna wanted Arjuna to do it. He wanted Arjuna to get the credit. Krishna likes to give the credit to his devotees. Can you think of some other examples where Krishna wanted? Uh, yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes. Yes. Uh, similarly, uh, when uh, Lord Krishna wanted Vishnu Dev to instruct. Yudhishthira Maharaj, to depart him the knowledge. Oh, very nice, yes. In the first canto, we have the departure of Grandfather Bhishma, and prior to his departure, he spent many days instructing Maharaj Yudhishthira in how to rule the kingdom. Yes, very good. Lord Krishna himself was not able to pacify the mind of Maharaj Yudhisthira after the battle of Kurukshetra. He was feeling so disturbed that so many lives had been lost just so that he could have a kingdom, that he could rule. So he felt very guilty and Lord Krishna brought him to Grandfather Bhishma and Grandfather Bhishma spoke and enlightened him and helped him to adjust and understand the, the, the nature of the event and deal with it in the proper manner. So that's a very nice example. Thank you, Maharaji. Yes, another one? Uh, Maharaj, one more example, if it is correct, I don't know, please correct me. Uh, when uh, uh, Durva Samuni tells uh, to Pandavas that I'm coming for the meal and uh, uh, Draupati was in a dilemma uh, for Akshapatram, and how she calls up Krishna and then Krishna comes and helps. Well, she took that's she took service from Krishna, right? Yes. But we we wanted we were thinking of cases where Krishna is depending on the devotee. Yes. Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Lord Krishna instructs Uddhava Uddhava Maharaj before he's leaving this abode. He instructs Uddhava to give the knowledge of the Lord. Oh, Uddhava. okay. Yes, uh, Krishna, before departing okay. from this world, he wanted Uddhava to remain. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, Lord Chaitanya also instructs Uddhava to give the responsibility to Nityananda Prabhu and Haridas Thakur for uh, distributing the Hodinam. Okay, yes. Lord, Nich Lord Chaitanya asked. Lord Nityananda and Hari does to go door to door and ask everyone to chant and read the books and worship Krishna. And Lord Chaitanya told Lord Nityananda to stay in Bengal and preach there. Yes, very nice. Even can we say that uh, Lord Chaitanya empowered Ramanand Rai to speak? Like he was asking questions and it said that he only empowered him to give the answers. So he was only speaking through Ramanand Rai. Well, uh, we could say that's also the humility of Ramananda Rai, that he felt that Lord Chaitanya was speaking through him. 
but it's an interesting example yeah it is like just as krishna told arjuna be an instrument in my service so ramananda rai was an in instrument in the service of lord chaitanya of course lord chaitanya knew everything but still he took the the time he took he went he put the questions to ramananda rai so that he could hear all the topics of Krishna explained by Ramananda Rai. Yes, interesting example. Yes. Anything else? Very good. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, even Madan Mohanji told uh, Sanatan Goswami, I want to eat uh, not soup, uh, dry chapati. <laughs> <laughs> that is also, I don't know. Mm. Yes, it certainly, it certainly happened like that, that Madame Mohan was not so happy with the, the, the dried bread which Sanatan was offering to him, and there was no salt. <laughs> but uh, the Lord had to accept, <laughs> right? The Lord had... The, the Sanatan said, well, I don't have any more, I don't have anything else to give you, so please kindly accept. So the Lord was required to accept like that. Mm. Yeah, the Lord actually wanted a better offering. He wanted, he would have he preferred, because he, originally he was staying in the home of another Brahman, and they were feeding him nice offerings, but when he went with Sanatan, then the offerings became very, very simple and just simply some uh, dry bread or baked bread, whatever he could make with some wheat which he found. So Madame Mohan complained that, don't you even have salt? <laughs> and Sanatan said, no, I'm sorry, what can I do? This is... But Madame Mohan accepted because of the pure love of Sanatan. So this, that's not a very clear example of the devotee serving Krishna. We, you know, we're looking for cases where the, the devotee can actually give Krishna and satisfy Krishna. Of course, but th there was a pastime. Madan Mohan was, was satisfied with the pure love of Sanata. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yes, Prabhu. Bhima killing Jarasandha. Bhima killing Jarasandha. Okay. <laughs> That's an interesting one. Yeah. The Lord Krishna brought Bhima and Arjuna with him to Jarasandha. And Jarasandha wouldn't fight with Krishna or Arjuna, but he chose to fight with Bhima. He thought Bhima will have, give me a good fight. But then it was Lord Krishna who had to show Bhima how to defeat him, right? Bhima had to, he wouldn't have been able to defeat Jarasandha without the instructions from Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna knew the story about Jarasandha, how he'd been joined by the witch Jara. So there was help there coming from Krishna. <laughs> so that was Krishna helping his devotee. But we're talking about the devotee doing, giving to Krishna, doing for Krishna. Yeah? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Maharaj, can we say, like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu insisted Nityananda Prabhu to enter into Dragasta life while he was actually taking sannyasa out of... He asked Nityananda Prabhu to actually, in the Dragasta life and uh, he performed Sankirtana area. Yeah. They but... preached. Yeah, that may be true, but that's not in relation to this particular point. You know, I don't think that really brings out the, 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 what we're talking about, about how the devotee wants to serve the Lord. He wants giving, taking instruction from the Lord to do a particular service. Okay, oh, I see your point, that you're saying that Lord Chaitanya, but, you know, it's, I, I don't know, we're not told very much about what was actually there. 
in terms of Lord Chaitanya instructing Lord Nityananda that he should marry in, in the householder life, uh, was it? It's not something which is talked about very much. I'm not very clear about it. Hare Krishna Maharaj, you can say uh, Shrinanji asked from Madhvinder Puri, uh, Chandan and uh, Yes, that's right, that's true. After the deity was discovered, then he wanted Chandan. So Madhavendra Puri went there to all the way to Puri to get the Chandan and the camphor. And then when he was coming back, then he said, give it to Gopinath at Ramuna. So these were all, these were all instructions coming from the Lord and the devotee carried them out religiously. In this connection, can we add Kichar Gopinath's past name also? Yes, uh, the, the, well, that's Krishna serving the devotee. Krishna stole yes. the sweet rice for his devotee. But we're talking about the devotee giving service to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. You could say, well, Madhavendra Puri is going to learn how to make the sweet rice and then he'll go back and make it for Srinathji or Gopal and Govardhan at that time. Okay, so many examples are there and Prabhupada talks about his own particular how Krishna told him about he wanted the books written, he wanted the, the preaching done, that Krishna could have done it himself but Krishna inspired from the heart. All right, so going ahead, text number six, offering prof profuse obeisances. Devotees should offer respectful obeisances unto M Mother Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune, and pray as follows. So we were praying to Vishnu, and now we're praying to Mother Lakshmi. So this is interesting. And here in the, the sixth canto, Srimad Bhagavatam, earlier we heard about Daksha. Now, who was Daksha praying to? Who did Daksha? Who did Daksha pray to? This is Brahma. Sorry, who did he pray to? Brahmaji? No, not exactly. Well, who did Chitraketu pray to? Who did he worship? Sankarsha. Sankarsha. Yes. Lord Sankarsha. Yes, Lord Sankarsha. And how does he pray to Lord Sankarsha? And what for? Lord Sankarsha is like the super soul. Right? It's like, like the super soul. And Daksha also, his prayers are also offered to the super soul. They're just offered to the Lord. There's no potency there. But here, the, in these prayers, in this Vrat, the prayers are offered to Lord Vishnu along with Lakshmi. The Lord's potency is there with him. Previously, the prayers were only offered to the Lord in the form of the super soul. But here, we've got praying to Lord Vishnu and the, now to Lakshmi. So Prabhupada points out that, the, that we, well, it's indicating anyway, that the Lord and his potency, the Lord is never alone. Krishna is never alone. You know, some people, they have these paintings of Krishna and they put a, a, a light coming out from his face. They have the beautiful picture of Krishna, so attractive face. And then they have a fulgent light coming out all around from his face, the effulgence. And Prabhupada said, oh, this kind of painting, this is influenced by impersonalism. Prabhupada liked to see Lord Krishna 
along with his potency. It should never be alone. Krishna with Balaram, or Krishna with Mother Yashoda, or Radha Krishna, but not just simply Krishna. It's, and we see also like that, Shiva, Lord Shiva is worshipped along with Mother Parvati. They're always together. Lord Rama is always with Mother Sita. So here we have the worship of Vishnu and he's also with Mother Lakshmi. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is also, we, we have Gaur Nitai or Gaur Gadarhar, like that. So the Lord is not alone. So here we have the prayers offered to the Goddess of Fortune, Mother Lakshmi. She's described, O internal energy of Lord Vishnu, you are as good as Lord Vishnu himself, for you have all of his qualities and opulences. So, the devotee is praying to Mother Lakshmi in this way. And this is very important for us to understand how to regard Mother Lakshmi. At the end of the purport, Prabhupada mentions, one cannot keep Lakshmi in one's home without Lord Vishnu. To think that one can do so is very dangerous. To keep Lakshmi or the riches of the Lord without the service of the Lord is always dangerous, for then Lakshmi becomes the illusory energy. With Lord Vishnu, however, Lakshmi is the spiritual energy. So Prabhupada is giving us very important instruction here. Of course, Lakshmi is, people will say, she's chanchal, she's chanchala, right? chanchal, she's restless, she doesn't stay in one place. We all have the experience, we get some wealth, we get some money, it's very difficult to keep it, it will soon go. That's the nature of Lakshmi. But although she is chanchal, she's very chaste to Lord Vishnu and she never leaves him. She's always there on, in the chest of Lord Vishnu. So Prabhupada says, you must always worship Lord Vishnu. Don't just keep, don't just worship Lakshmi. People are fond to worship Lakshmi, but if we don't worship Lord Vishnu, then it won't be good. It will become the illusory energy. But when Lord Vishnu is there, then Lakshmi is the spiritual energy. And this point comes up in a future purport also, that this is important for us to understand what is the position of Mother Lakshmi. Okay, so going ahead, text number seven. Praying again to Vishnu, that he's full in six opulences, the husband of Lakshmi, you are accompanied by many associates, I offer all my paraphernalia. And this is an important verse, text number seven, Prabhupada talks about it, how this verse is used in deity worship. Anyone engaged in deity worship should chant this mantra as quoted above, Om Namo Bhagavate Mahapurushaya, beginning like that, right? It's not a long mantra, but an important mantra which is often used in the deity worship. So worshipping the deities, one should recite these different mantras. I'm sure if you do the deity worship course here in Mayapur, 
they will teach you these mantras. Then after, when you worship the deity, you offer all different paraphernalia. So this is, you know, to do the vrat, you have to do this every day, worship the deity with great attention, with all paraphernalia, water to wash his feet, hands and mouth, water for his bath. One must offer him various presentations for his worship, nice garments, a sacred thread, ornaments, scents, flowers, incense and lamps. Right? If you do deity worship, these are the different off items which you're supposed to offer in the course of the worship. So worship the Lord with all the paraphernalia and then chant the following mantra while offering 12 oblations of ghee on the sacred fire. So you have to, you have to make a fire every day. You can see to perform this vrat, it's not such a small thing. So a little bit detailed, you have to worship the deity nicely. You also have to have a sacred fire, offer 12 oblations, Om Namo Bhagavate Mahapurushaya Mahabhibhuti Pataye Swaha, like that, 12 times. No, 12 times is not a lot. You have to do it every day. You do it every day, you become proficient, you can do it in no time. And sacred fire, just like in the Gurukula over here in Mayapur, in the Gurukula, traditional Gurukula, they have the fire, they keep the fire burning. And so every morning they do the yagya, every evening they do it again also. And the Gurukula students, they're all trained to do these yagya. Daily thing, every day. Okay, text number nine. If one desires all opulences, his duty is to daily worship Lord Vishnu with his wife Lakshmi. Well, you may not desire all opulences, but even though you don't desire opulences, still the duty is there to worship Lord Vishnu with his wife Lakshmi. And with great devotion, one should worship him. And the process was given in the previous verses and it's mentioned Lord Vishnu and the Goddess of Fortune are an immensely powerful combination. They are bestower of all benedictions and the sources of all good fortune. Therefore the duty of everyone is to worship Lakshmi Narayan. Worship of Lakshmi Narayan of course, it's not strictly in our line, in the Gaudiya Vaishnavas, we worship Radha and Krishna. And, but Prabhupada told us our, that we should worship Radha and Krishna more in the mood of Lakshmi Narayan. He didn't want us to make the worship too simple. He liked to see the worship opulent, attractive, that it's more attractive. If you worship in the mood of Vrindavan, then it becomes very simple. Prabhupada liked to see the deities worship very nicely, he liked to see nice dresses. He was very particular about these things. He wanted to see everything done very nicely. And we do see ISKCON temples generally have a good reputation for a very high standard of deity worship. particularly in the Sringar, the dresses which they offer to the deities. They're very beautiful and elaborately decorated. So, it's mentioned that Lakshmi Narayan are in the heart of everyone. It's not just simply the super soul, but Lord Narayan is there, and Lord Narayan is not alone, but he's with Mother Lakshmi. So the two of them are there within the heart of all living entities, and they're not endowed with 
they are not endowed with the opulence of Lord Vishnu. However, non-devotees do not realize that Lord Vishnu stays with his eternal consort. Lakshmi, within the heart of all living entities, they are not endowed with the opulence of Vishnu. Unscrupulous men sometimes address a poor man as Daridra Narayan or Pur Narayan. This is most unscientific. Lord Vishnu and Lakshmi are always situated in everyone's heart, but this does not mean that everyone is Narayan especially not those in poverty. This is a most abominable term to use in connection with Narayan. Narayan never becomes poor and therefore he can never be called Daridra Narayan. Narayan is certainly situated in everyone's heart, but he is neither poor nor rich. Only unscrupulous persons who do not know the opulence of Narayan try to afflict him with poverty. So we have to understand the transcendental position of Lord Narayan, that he is not, we cannot judge in terms of material circumstances. Of course, all the opulences is, they, they are his. He has nothing to possess. It's all his. Material life, we're all busy trying to get more because we don't possess anything. But for Lord Narayan, everything is his. So he doesn't have to worry to endeavor to get things. So the mood in offering this vrat, we can see more, uh, text number 10, the importance of humility. The, there has to be this genuine humility in worshipping the Lord. Offering obeisances, falling on the ground like a rod, and then chanting the mantra ten times. Then one should chant the following prayer. So like this, one has to worship the Lord. describing how to worship Mother Lakshmi, Lord Vishnu. Mother Lakshmi is represented in the material world as the external energy, but actually she is always the internal energy of the Lord. We will hear Mother Lakshmi is the, she is Vishnu Tattva. She is not just Jiva Tattva. She is not just a Jiva. She is Vishnu Tattva. She is the Shakti of the Lord. She is Maha Mai, Maha Maya. Maya means Shakti. So she is the Maha Shakti of the Lord. And as, as, as stated here in this text, Mother Lakshmi is extremely difficult to understand because she is so powerful that the jurisdiction of her power is difficult to overcome. So we want to understand the importance of Lord Vishnu, worshipping Lord Vishnu, and don't worship Lord Vishnu alone. And similarly, we don't worship Lakshmi alone. They are together. Then going ahead, text number 12, describe about the, the position of the Lord, that he is, he is sacrifice personified. And Lakshmi is the embodiment of spiritual activities. The original form of worship offered unto the Lord, whereas you are the enjoyer of all sacrifices. So the Maharaj, yes. Sorry for interruption, Maharaj. Can you please explain? Uh, like I just want to understand uh, how we are considering Mother Lakshmi as the external energy of the Lord. 
generally we're thinking Lakshmi is a jiva. People are thinking like that. In fact, even Madhvacharya in the in Madhva Sampradaya, they think of Lakshmi like that, as being Jiva Tattva. They don't think of her as being Vishnu Tattva. They see her in a different way. They see her that she's a Jiva, a living entity, who is engaged in the service of the Lord. So we don't accept this statement and you'll see it later on and there's another verse with a purport and Prabhupada quotes the statements given by Baladeva Vidya Bhusan that Lakshmi is not the material energy, she's not Jiva Tattva, that she's Vishnu Tattva. But People are thinking, well, Lakshmi, Lakshmi's, they're thinking wealth, and they're thinking this wealth is material. They're not thinking of it in relation to Lord Vishnu. But we don't think of Lakshmi like that, or at least we shouldn't. We should understand this Lakshmi is Lord Vishnu's property, right? When Ravan took Mother Sita away from Lord Ram, Lord Ram was very angry. Lord Rama looked across the ocean and the water began to become, became hot and all the fish were dying because Lord Rama was so angry that this Ravan had taken Mother Sita away. So Mother Sita she is the personification of the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi. And so she, she belongs to the Supreme Lord. It's a nation of, the nature of Ravan-like people, they want to take Lakshmi away from Lord Vishnu. They think it's material. They don't understand the spiritual position of Mother Lakshmi. So this is offence. They're thinking Mother Lakshmi, they're thinking Lakshmi to be material. They're thinking she's Jiva Tattva. They're thinking Lakshmi is just for my enjoyment. All the Ravan-like people, they want to get the wealth. They want to take Sita away from Ra. That's the mood. You understand? Yes, Ma yes, Maharaj. So, uh, even uh, the devotees in Sri Parampara think Mother Lakshmi is Jiva Tattva? And I don't know about the Sri, the Sri Vaishnavas. I don't know what their opinion is. But it's mentioned... No, huh? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Maharaj. No, Maharaj. They, 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 he's a spiritual platform only. Okay. Yeah. Eternal Mother. Uh -huh. It's only mentioned the Madhvas think like this, yeah. Okay, Maharaj, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So, we give all respect to the potency of the Lord. We see the, the potency, Shakti and Shakti Man, that they're non different, right? They're connected together. The Lord and His potencies. Okay, so then here we here we go. This next text, text number thirteen, it's mentioned there about the the nature of Mother Lakshmi. Mentioned in the in the verse, Mother Lakshmi, who is here, is the reservoir of all spiritual qualities. Whereas you manifest and enjoy all these qualities. Indeed, you are actually the enjoyer of everything. You live as the super soul of all living entities. And the goddess of fortune is the form of their bodies, senses and minds. She also has a holy name and form. Whereas you are the support of all such names and forms and the cause for their manifestation. 
So like the, the prayers are offered to Lord Vishnu and to Mother Lakshmi. So there's a purport, Prabhupada mentions at Madhvacharya, their understanding. The first term is the Supreme Lord Vishnu and the second term is the Jiva Tattva. Lakshmi Devi, being dependent on Lord Vishnu, is sometimes counted among the Jivas. The Gaudiya Vaishnavas, however, describe Lakshmi Devi in accordance with the following two verses from Primeya Ratnavali or of Baladeva Vijupabhusan. And then the, the first verse is a quotation from the Vishnu Purana. So a quote from the Vishnu Purana, O best of the Brahmins, Lakshmi Ji is the constant companion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Vishnu. And therefore she is called Anapayini. She is the mother of all creation as Lord Vishnu is all-pervading, his spiritual potency, Mother Lakshmi, is also all-pervading. Lord Vishnu has three principal potencies, internal, external and marginal. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has accepted Parashakti, the spiritual energy of the Lord, as being identical with the Lord. Thus, she is also included in this independent Vishnu Tattva. So like that, the very authoritative reference here. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has, in accordance with the statement in the Vishnu Purana, has described Lakshmi as being identical with the Vishnu Tattva. The correct conclusion is that descriptions of Lakshmi as being different from Vish Vishnu are stated when an eternally liberated living entity is imbued with the quality of Lakshmi. They do not pertain to Mother Lakshmi, the eternal consort of Lord Vishnu. So somebody may have the qualities of Mother Lakshmi, it doesn't mean they're actually Mother Lakshmi. Mother Lakshmi is the eternal consort of the Lord. There's a big difference between the Lord and his potencies, and uh, bet between the living entities and the Lord. But Mother Lakshmi is not just simply an ordinary jiva. She's the potency of the Lord. So she's described as being Vishnu Tattva. It's an important point. So this, you can see we're very close to the Sri Vaishnavas. The Sri Vaishnavas, they understand like that. Okay, so then more prayers are offered. May my ambitions be fulfilled by your grace. So then Text, there, text 15, Sugadeva Goswami is now speaking, he's describing, Thus one should worship Lord Vishnu, who is known as Srinivasa, along with Mother Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune, by offering prayers according to the process mentioned above. After removing all the paraphernalia, one should offer them water to wash their hands and mouth, and then one should worship them again. Then with devotion and humility, offer prayers to the Lord and Mother Lakshmi. Then one should smell the remnants of the food offered and then again worship the Lord and Lakshmi Ji. So you can see, uh, it's an elaborate vow and to follow this vow it will take a lot of devotion. You have to be devoted, you have to be willing to but just like once you become familiar, then it can, can be done. It won't take so much time. But it's in a, a, a worshipping the Lord is one of the nine angas of devotional service. Directly serving the Supreme Lord. Very powerful. So the next text, 
text number 17 talks about who should do this worship. Should the husband do it on his own or does the wife do it? What if the wife can't do it? Or sometimes the husband doesn't do it, sometimes the wife does it. And then what should be the mood? So it's mentioned here, accepting her husband as the representative of the Supreme Lord, a wife should worship him with unalloyed devotion by offering him prasad. The husband, being very pleased with his wife, should engage himself in the affairs of his family. So this is very nice. The wife is worshipping, she should worship her husband. We heard in the previous chapter that there is someone who is very much in bodily consciousness of life, then they can also worship their husband. They can worship their husband as being the representative of the Supreme Lord. So here it, it is also mentioned that one can worship the Lord, one can worship your husband. Some women like to do that. It's not wrong. It's very nice. The husband should be pleased naturally. The, the wife is worshipping so nicely. Husband should be pleased. Not that the husband's God, but the wife sees him as the representative of God. Just like the spiritual master, Guru Patni, right? And so the husband is the guru of the wife. So the wife can recognize her husband like that. And then the husband will become eager to serve the family. If, if the husband and wife do like this, then they'll never, marriage will never fail. Prabhupada explains, family relationship of husband and wife should be established spiritually according to the process mentioned above. Right. The wife should be sincere, husband should be faithful, they have to cooperate together. Text 18 describes, one person is sufficient to execute this devotional service. If the wife is unable to execute this process, the husband should carefully do so, and the faithful wife will share the result. Husband and wife, they share each other's pious and sinful activities. The wife is the benefactor of the pious activities of the husband, and the husband also is a ben he, he enjoys the pious activities of the wife. They share, joint, right? They share each other's pious and sinful activities. So, we, and, and Prabhupada also, we heard the other previous chapter, wife is the better half of the husband. So like half, they work, they're together and they, they enjoy and suffer for each other's pious and sinful activities. So if the wife cannot do the worship, let the husband do it. Sometimes the wife is contaminated, she's not pure, so let, then the husband has to do the worship. There are many couples like that. When the wife is com contaminated, the husband will do all the cooking, and he will do all the puja, and the wife will just stay back. She can just chant. Prabhupada explains, relationship between husband and wife is firmly established when the wife is faithful and the husband sincere. Then, even if the wife being weaker 
is unable to execute devotional service with her husband, if she is chaste and sincere, she shares half of her husband's activities. This is, this is married life. You share each other's pious and sinful activities. So it's a duty, husband and wife, to cooperate together, to help each other. When Prabhupada would see couples married in Krishna consciousness, he would tell them, now you should be able to do twice as much service. Now you're a couple, you're united, now you can do twice as much service. Not that we think now we're married, we do less. Prabhupada said you should have to do twice what you usually do, because you're two, so you can do more. So, we hear, it's described here, except this Vishnu Vrat, which is a vow in devotional service and not deviate from its execution to engage in anything else. So you begin this vow, you make a vow, it's serious. You have to be very careful to follow it through. So mention what you have to do, offer the remnants of prasad, flower garlands, sandalwood pulp, ornaments, daily worship the brahmana and worship women who, are, who peacefully live with their husbands and children. Every day the wife must continue following the regulative principles to worship Lord Vishnu with great devotion. Thereafter, Lord Vishnu should be laid in his bed and then one should take prasad. In this way, husband and wife will be purified and will live and will have all their desires fulfilled. You have, we all have desires, so this is the best way to, for, to satisfy all the desires. We recognize Lord Vishnu as the Supreme. So you can do that worship. Certainly the benefit is very great. So chaste wife must per perform such service continuously for one year. After one year passes, she should fast on the full moon day in the month of Kartik. After one year of doing, then still fasting on the full moon day, that's the last day, and then on the morning of the next day, one should wash oneself after worshipping Lord Krishna and you should cook as one cooks for festivals and you cook sweet rice with ghee. And with this prep preparation, the husband should offer oblations to the fire twelve times. Thereafter, he should satisfy the brahmanas when the satisfied brahmanas bestow their blessings, he should devo devout devotedly offer them respectful obeisances with his head, and with their permission he should take prasad. Before taking his meal, husband must first seat the acharya comfortably, and along with his relatives and friends, he should control his speech and offer prasad to the guru. Then the wife should eat the remnants of the oblations of sweet rice cooked with ghee. Eating the remnants ensures a learned, devoted son and all good fortune. So we see like this uh, in Mahabharata and Ramayan and some places even in Srimad Bhagavatam, we have these kind of incidents where the great sages would come and they would give the sweet rice to the wife and tell the woman, you take the sweet rice and you'll have a son, you'll get a good child. So here it's mentioned also like that, you want to get a good son, things which you have to do. Okay. Uh,
going ahead. In this vow, a ritualistic ceremony is observed according to the description of Shastra. Even in this life, a man will be able to achieve all the benedictions he desires from the Lord. A wife who performs this ritualistic ceremony will surely receive good fortune, opulence, sons, a long-living husband, a good reputation, and a good home. We can get everything from this worship. You just have to spend one year and do it very carefully. As recommended in this verse, a woman will receive all these desirable benedictions and a man will also be able to receive all benedictions from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Thus, by performing this particular type of rut, a man and a woman in Krishna consciousness will be happy in this material world. And because of being Krishna conscious, they will be promoted to the spiritual world. We can understand it's not a very easy thing to follow. To do a vrat like this for a period of one year will take a lot of concentration, a lot of determination. We know, we find ourselves, uh, we see devotees, how difficult it is for them sometimes to have followed strictly the program, to come to the morning program and to chant 16 rounds every day. But certainly, if you do all these things, if we follow our four regulative principles, if you have a little morning program, you worship the deities, worship Tosi, worship the Acharya, and then we offer the food to the deity and take prasad, if we're doing all, all our Krishna conscious program is not so different from the vow which is mentioned here in this chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam. And we do see that devotees who strictly follow, they do get all opulences. They're very much happy and satisfied in Krishna consciousness, that their lives are taken care of. And we can be sure that they will also go back to Godhead at the end of life. They're going to get perfection. All right, then the final verse mentions about the different benefits, who gets the benefit and everything, what you get. An unmarried girl observes this vrat, she will be able to get a very good husband. If a woman who is a vira has no husband or son executes this ceremony, she can be promoted to the spiritual world. A woman who has children, whose, ch whose children have died after birth, can get a child with a long duration of life and also become very fortunate in possessing wealth. If a woman is unfortunate, she will become fortunate. And if ugly, she will become beautiful. By observing this vrat, a diseased man can gain relief from his disease and have an able body with which to work. If one recites this, just by reciting this narration, while offering oblations to the pitas and demigods, especially during the Shrug ceremony, the demigods and inhabitants of Pitriloka will be extremely pleased with him and bestow upon him the fulfillment of all desires. After one performs this ritualistic ceremony, Lord Vishnu and his wife, Mother Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune, are very pleased with him. O King Parikshit, now I've completely described how Diti performed this ceremony and had good children, the Maruts, and a happy life. I have, I have tried to explain this to you as elaborately as possible. Well, certainly explained quite elaborately. So anybody like to perform this vow? <laughs> 
But we already have our vow. We have our Krishna conscious vows. Our four regulative principles and daily chanting of the Maha Mantra. We have our morning program, study Srimad Bhagavatam, worship Tosi, like everything is there. We will get just as much, you will get the same benefit, if not more, by worshipping Lord Krishna as Srila Prabhupada has taught us. Okay, are there any questions or comments on this? Generally, Prabhupada would say that they share. If the wife does something, then the husband will also share. They also get some benefit from the wife's pious activities. And if the husband does it, the wife doesn't do it, the wife will benefit. She'll also get some benefit from the husband's pious activities. They share each other's pious and sinful activities. Prabhupada told us like that, but certainly it's indicated like that here. I don't know where you saw this in the third canto. Can you give me the place? No, Maharaj. In the connection there was there, there was Well, sometimes husband, yeah. Yes, sometimes. Sometimes husband, yeah. Sometimes husband, what? They, they will not involve any devotional activities. They think that wife is doing, so why he not do? That's so right. That, uh, yeah. But their duty is to serve the family. Mm -hmm. Right? That they're doing. I know I used to go to, when I was doing life membership work in India, in particularly Calcutta, people would often tell me like that, the men would say, oh, my wife does everything, my wife does it, because the wife would be at home, and so her job business at home is to worship the Lord and to do the prayers and everything like that. And what's his duty? His duty is to maintain the family to look after the expenses and to provide the money for everything so that they can also perform charity and do different things, and donate to temples and donate to Brahmins, worship the Brahmins, do that kind of thing. Husband has that duty. It's not that the husband should be irresponsible, not do anything. Husband's also pre playing a part. How can the wife do it? How can the wife do the worship if the husband doesn't provide? Yes, yeah. So that's you know that's part of part of the part of the marriage ceremony. Yes. Could, could you say this again? Who, who should advise? Angira should have advised? Chitraketu. King Chitraketu. Uh-huh. 
to observe this Kumsavana uh, for his life. Rather than just giving him the sun. Yeah. Well, uh, why didn't he do that? Because he, he knew Chitraketu is an advanced devotee. So he wanted to bring him out from, he wanted him to, he wanted to, him to, to experience the nature of the material life, the miseries and the temporary nature of the material world. So Angira chose that he should get a son who would bring him also the distress along with the happiness. And in this way, by losing his son, then Chitraketu became detached from the material world. The business of the sadhu is to get people out from the attachment. So Chitraketu was already an advanced devotee, so he want, uh, Angira and Narada Muni, they wanted to bring him out. They didn't want to get him more attached to the material world. That's what would have happened if they'd given him the sun. Thank you, Maharaj. If, they, if, they'd, they'd have, if they'd had to hit all of his wives, his millions of wives, all doing this vow for one year, then you may have ended up with so many sons, it would become completely entangled in family life and would never have got out the material world. But the business of the sadhu is to awaken the spiritual consciousness of people, not just to satisfy their material needs. That's not the business of a sadhu like Narada Muni, right? Narada Muni, they're preaching Bhagavad Dharma and Bhagavad Dharma is a parallel track with Vairagya Vidya. So they want to awaken the Vairagya along with the Vidya. They don't want to just satisfy their material desires. That is not the business of the sadhu. The real sadhu, their business is to cut, to cut the attachment to the material world, to take that away. Right? Krishna says, when I am very merciful to someone, I take everything away. This is the business of the sadhu, take everything away to give something better. And so if they just give, instructed him in this Pumsan, Pumsan of Vrat, and, and Maharaj Chitra Ketu got the sons, he, he'd just still, still be here in the material world. He would never have got back to Godhead. But Narada Muni wants to get him out of the material world. He wants to get him back to Godhead. So it's an important point you brought up. Yeah, we have to understand what is the real mercy of the sadhu, of the devotees like Narada Muni and Angira. Yes, Hare Krishna. One, uh, I wanted to understand a little more clearly. Bhagavatam is uh, Nirmatsara Nam Satam, like it's uh, like, uh, sorry, it is uh, Amala Purana. So it talks about only the pure devotional service. But we see so many people in the Bhagavatam have worshipped the Lord with various different material desires. Yes. So how do we understand that? Because generally it is said that this is this uh, uh, Purana is not talking about any Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha, only the pure devotional service. But a lot of uh, devotees have worshipped Krishna in this Bhagavatam also with various material desires. Yes, but we see that those who worship Krishna, even they had material desires, they became purified. They made, that, they made some advancement. They're, they developed a better 
better nature, better qualities, they made some progress. So that's an inducement for the people who have material desires, that if they will take up devotional service, they can become a better person. They may not, they're not, maybe not be ready for, for pure devotion, but they can greatly improve. They can become much better than they were. Hmm? Indra never became de pure devotee Maharaj. So many things he did, so many times he got lessons, but he never became pure devotee. He's a mixed devotee. He's a devotee. He's a mixed devotee. Yeah, he has some material desires. He has some attachments. But he's still he's obedient to the Lord. And we see after he lifted up Govardhan Hill, he became very humble and he came and offered prayers. And even after he had offered prayers, then he went to Surabi Kunj because he knew he had done wrong. And we, he went to Surabi Kunj, if you come on Navadvi Parikrama, actually just today we went there to Surabi Kunj where Indra had come. After he had offended Lord Krishna, he'd come there and he'd chanted the holy name. And so, he, he, you know, you, 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 can't, you can't criticize him. He does a lot of service. He may have faults, but still he does a lot of service. And to get to that position of Indra, you have to have a lot of punya, you have to have done a lot of pious activities. Not so small thing. So we shouldn't be so critical of the, the demigods. We, we know they're not pure devotees, but they're very much appreciated by Lord Vishnu because they help him to oversee the affairs of the universe. So whenever there's difficulties, then they have to go to Lord Vishnu and report. And they have to go and tell him. Sometimes the Lord has to come and help them. So we, we have to offer our respects to people like Indra. We shouldn't, certainly we don't want to criticize. Of course, we can learn. We can see the problems, the faults, how dangerous it is. You get such a big position, become like that, become the king of heaven, beautiful women around you and everything, so much opulence. But then he gets cursed, he becomes a pig. Brihaspati can curse him to become a pig. So, Maharaj, do we also, and can we understand like that, that these great devotees of the Lord uh, are put into the conditions to teach us the lesson? Like Prabhupada says, ki when the mother, mother wants to teach the daughter-in-law, she teaches the daughter. Yes, we're supposed to learn from all of these devotees, right? We do. This is why Krishna Leela is there. Krishna Leela, Krishna is teaching us. Indra, Brahma, all these people, big demigods, the problems they have in practicing devotional service. You know, they have problems. Just imagine our pro how we also can expect to have problems. We're only little people, small people. They're big, big people in the universe and they have problems. So we should learn from them. We should be humble and be respectful to them. They're very great personalities. They're taking on so much service on behalf of the Lord. So offering respects to Indra,
certainly we, we know they have they have faults but we that, that's instructive for us as you say we have to learn from these faults be very careful ourselves not to commit any not to become proud we saw maharaj chitraketu maharaj chitraketu why did he become proud Right? Lord Vishnu wanted to correct his pride. Why was Maharaj Chitraketu proud? What was the cause of his pride? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, because he was a devotee of the Lord, that he was proud. Yes, but there was something which particularly happened that made him more proud. What happened to him? Anybody remember? He thought that he can correct Lord Shiva because Lord Shiva is in this position and he thought that he should correct him. Yeah, but why, why, did, he, but why did he become proud? He thought that he thought he could correct him. What was it that made him proud? Because he had darshan of Shankar. Yes, right. That's the point. And he was favored by him. Yeah. Because he had the darshan, he personally met with Lord Sankarshan. So after that, he became a little proud. You know, I met the Lord. You know, so he thought like that. He, you know, he was very advanced. He was very advanced. He could have cursed Mother Durga. He could have cursed Parvati himself, but he didn't do it. He was powerful enough to do it, but he didn't do it. And so he had just a little, little pride there that he'd become, he'd, he was, he had actually met with Lord Sankarshan. Lord Sankarshan had appeared to him and, and given him instruction or he'd offered prayers like that. So that was his, the cause of his pride. So you meet the Lord. You can become proud. You have to be very, we have to be so humble. It's so easy to become forgetful of our actual position. To remember how small and how insignificant we are. Just look, Maharaj Chitraketu, he was so, he was a, such a big king. And then he became king of the higher planet with all the, Beautiful women, the Vijadari ladies, traveling with them. But he was still chanting, he was still glorifying the Lord. But he had that little pride that he had met the Lord. So the Lord wanted to remove that pride. And he arranged for Mother Parvati's curse. All right, any other points? So we have finished then the sixth canto, and this is the completion of your Bhakti Vai Bhav. So we can congratulate all of you. Are you going to go on and do Bhakti Vedanta? Uh, Maharaj, uh, we have left with one more unit. Uh, which is unit number 25, Vedic Cosmology, uh, because of some reason, you know, uh, you know like uh, we couldn't be able to get the teacher for, to teach that particular unit. Uh, but now Padmanayan Prabhu has confirmed, uh, oh, soon we are going to have that Maharaj. After that, I mean, with, with that we will complete this uh, Bhakti Vaibhav. Okay. And uh, if you bless this Maharaj, yes, you want to continue with Bhakti Vedanta. Okay, very good. Very nice. So I thank all of you very much for giving me the opportunity to lead you in your study here with this section of the Bhagavatam. And thank you very much and we look forward to having more association in the future. So like that we will conclude the class here this evening. Srila Prabhupada. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Yeah.
Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Yes, Maharaj. Jai. Thank you. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Ki Jai. Jai. Maharaj, today, I mean, before you, I mean, Maharaj, thank you very much for showering your...